Good morning. Good to see everybody here on Christmas Sunday. Praise God. The title of our lesson this morning is The Savior is Born. The Savior is Born. Praise God. Folks, let's go to the Lord as we normally do. Each and every one of us pray in our own way. Let's ask the Lord to lead us into truth as we study His, His Word this morning. Let's go to Him. Dear Heavenly Father, God, as we come to You this morning, Lord, with thankful hearts, God, we thank You for that Savior that was sent so long ago on our behalf. Lord, to deliver us. God, we just ask this morning that You would send Your Spirit to be with us as we study Your Word. Lord, lead us into truth this morning. God, and we'll thank You and we'll praise You. We'll give You the glory. We'll give You the honor. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Savior is born. Our central truth this morning says Jesus was born to be the Savior of the world. Thank God, all people. The whole world. Our key verse is Luke 2, 11. It says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Our learning objectives this morning. One, to understand the significance of God's of the Savior's birth in the lives of individuals, communities, and nations. Two, to be confident in sharing the true meaning of Christmas with unbelievers. Three, to be mo motivated to do something tangible to represent Christ to someone in need this week. And, you know, that's one of the most important things. Uh, I tell you, it was, uh, I guess, maybe more of a treat for us handing out treats this week <laughs> because a lot of times when folks come to the door and all you have is a flyer in your hand and you're inviting them some of them take it pretty pretty good and they'll they'll give you a smile and, and even a thank you for caring enough to come by and invite them to church but when you got that goodie bag in your hand I don't know they just their eye they they smile their smiles are bigger their eyes light up and it's a better bless it's a bigger blessing for you so you, all you that missed getting to help hand out the Christmas bags uh, to the community missed out because we enjoyed it. We had a good time. But this is, folks, to be able to do something tangible to represent Christ to someone in need this week. And, you know, we don't have to go out and spend a bunch of money and buy a big gift to do that. Just to tell somebody Merry Christmas to drop somebody a card, anything like that. It's easy for believers to get drawn in to the trappings of the Christmas season and forget the reality and the significance of our Savior's birth. This lesson brings us back to that reality and helps us to refocus on truths that we can share with others. What example can you give of a way that God has orchestrated an event or a circumstance in your life? Are there times that, or an example that you can give of any way that you think God has orchestrated something, an event or a circumstance in your life? I think we've all been pretty sure that God was behind certain things that take place in our lives. You know, the time had come for the long-awaited Messiah to be born. And we see God's hand orchestrating the events leading to the fulfillment of the prophecies surrounding the birth of Jesus. Because of a census, Joseph and Mary were required to travel to Bethlehem, the city of Joseph's ancestors, to register fulfilling the prophecy of Micah 5 and 2. And in Micah 5 and 2, that prophecy is, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. So it was important that the Savior was born in Bethlehem because of the prophets and the prophecies that, that had been foretold. The Christmas story is perhaps better known to the secular world than any other account in the Bible. Through the years, Christmas has been mentioned in countless television shows and movies. Actually, through music created just for the holiday seasons by believers and unbelievers alike have created a lot of the music that has been. 
and in displays of nativities that dot the landscape in the month of December. However, the simple yet profound significance of Christmas is often lost in the rush and the busyness of the season. People too often fail to grasp the powerful truth that God sent His only Son into this world as a sacrifice for sin to be the Savior of the world. We're going to begin to read in the second chapter of Luke. We're going to read the first five verses of Luke 2. It says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Now a careful study of the birth of Jesus reveals multiple ways that God used circumstances to accomplish his will. He used a Roman census to bring Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. And he used the jealous King Herod to fulfill, fulfill the prophecy of the cry that was heard in Ramah. In Ramah, Matthew 2 and 18. Because Matthew 2 and 18 says that in Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping. In great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. And of course the reason that she was weeping for our children in this, in this prophetic thing and this jealous king, Herod, we all know what he did. He ordered that all of the firstborn and the, the, the male ch child, male babies in, in Israel to be killed because he had heard of this king that was to be born. He didn't want to. He wanted to make sure that he <laughs> that he remained king. So what he did was ordered that, and this was another prophecy that was fulfilled through this cry that was heard in Rama. Luke, the physician and the historian, was who was a Gentile saved by God's grace, gave us some of the most precise time frames related to world history found in the New Testament. Caesar Augustus, who ruled from 27 B.C. to A.D. 14, had a census taken of the Roman Empire. This census was done while Cyrenius was governor of Syria. The Bible does not give the ages of Joseph and Mary, though it does refer to Joseph's occupation as a carpenter. Matthew 13 and 54 through 56 says, and when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue insomuch that they were astonished and said, whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not, the, is, not, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then had this man all these things so we know by this passage in Matthew that Joseph was a carpenter we also know through this passage that Jesus had brothers and sisters at least half brothers and sisters as it were you know there's another doctrine in a certain church I know that we talk about pretty regularly that, uh, they teach and for some reason believe that Mary didn't have any more children that she remained a virgin but the word of God doesn't bear that out the Bible does not give these some of these things and uh, we actually know that this placed him talking about Jesus within the social status of the working class not a priest or a teacher but not among the poorest classes either both Joseph and Mary were descendants of King David. The census forced people to return to the cities of their ancestral birth to register. For Joseph, this meant traveling about 100 miles south from Nazareth to Bethlehem, the city of David. This was at least a three-day journey, and it would have been inconvenient for Joseph. But for Mary, who was pregnant, it would have been probably very trying and wearisome. 
And it's noteworthy that God used a pagan ruler's census to bring the king of kings to the city of Bethlehem for the most momentous birth in all history. Jacob had prophesied over his son, Judah, that the king's scepter would not be taken from his line. And that prophecy, you know, so far back as Genesis 49 and 10 says, The scepter shall not part, depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So that's a prophecy all the way back to Genesis in the beginning that's talking about this scepter, this rule, this prophecy would find its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. Micah had prophesied that from Bethlehem would a ruler, would become a ruler in Israel. And God can use the circumstances of life to fulfill his purpose. Through difficult circumstances, he can open a way for miracles in our lives that would not have been possible if conditions had remained the same. God can also guide us through difficult situations that help us to grow spiritually and bring honor to him. So a lot of times when a certain circumstance arises and you think that you've been promised something even in God's word and a circumstance arises and you say, well, there went that one. God can do anything. Even though it doesn't look like his word's going to come to pass, it will come to pass. What are some specific events that you can recall, recall from the Christmas story that are recorded in Scripture? Of course, some of the things that are not recorded in this, in this uh, actual recording here in Luke that we have not, not going to be studying this morning, which actually took place later, but we usually tie it in with Christmas. And the Christmas story, of course, is the three wise men that came. And there are others. Describe a time when you endured a difficult situation that ultimately helped you grow spiritually. And in what ways did you grow? Folks, I want to tell you something. When those circumstances look impossible, and when it looks like that there's no way, and God makes a way, that builds our faith. And that helps us to grow spiritually. And a lot of times, Jesus allows these things to take place so that we'll be, so that we will actually build our faith and our trust in him but even after this birth it says the king of kings was placed in a manger let's read verses six and seven it says and it and so it was that while they were there the days were accomplished accomplished that she should be delivered and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, the location of Jesus' birth is irrefutable evidence of the love of God for humanity. The creator of the universe, the king of kings, gave up his divine privileges to begin a 33-year sojourn on this planet. As a matter of fact, Philippians 2 and 7. Talks about it. We'll read that. Philippians 2 and 7 says, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. As a result... Of our many Christmas pageants, we often imagine that Mary and Joseph trudged into Bethlehem mere hours before Jesus was born and knocked on the doors looking for a place to stay. However, the text does not tell us how long they were in Bethlehem before the time came for the birth of Mary's baby. It may have been a few hours or it could have been a few weeks since Joseph was likely surrounded by family who had gone to Bethlehem for the census and also may well have had relatives living there. We do not know what they found or that they found a place that was safe. It was private and it was humble for his birth. And I'm going to tell you something, that inn that it talked about, there was no more room at the inn, was a, an ancient place. I mean, there had been talked about that inn in Bethlehem, even been things recorded in Scripture for years before. So likely it wouldn't have offered, it wouldn't have been, I promise you, it wouldn't have been no uh, Hilton. It, it would have probably just been four walls and a roof and that type of a of, of refuge from 
the weather they probably would have had to still made a bed on the floor just as they normally would have in this manger in this place where they found refuge it doesn't really talk a whole lot about what it actually was it could have been a cave even but we do know that they found a place that was safe private and humble for his birth it was a stable for animals and perhaps a cave attached to a family home who knows Mary wrapped her firstborn baby in strips of cloth and placed him in a manger those born into the royalty riches and privilege often struggle to relate to the poor and the outcasts of society the pain and the despair of those who struggle to adequately feed themselves and provide the basic needs of life are unfamiliar to many who have enjoyed the abundance and a privileged birth often brings Jesus the Son of God came into the world in humble circumstances this is a powerful reminder that he can relate to our weaknesses and understand the struggles that we face in life looking at the events of this first Christmas we can catch a glimpse of the heart of God his great compassion for us Jesus came into the world without fanfare and without the privileges normally afforded to royalty in that lowly stable everlasting hope and light came into the world in the person of Jesus Christ what significance do you find in the Savior's coming into the world through humble circumstances do you think there's any significance in that that he came into the world under humble circumstances and he could have been born to a line of kings lived in the palace where Herod was at right right because the thing about it is royalty had very very little to do with common folks very very I mean they wouldn't even speak to them and people were accustomed to this type of treatment from royalty I think it's significant that he was born as I'm talking about a carpenter's son and not rich and, and not above most of the population until they go through it that's right, right. Uh, most people in the United States have not had to worry about where their next meal is coming from most and there have been some that have but I've never you can tell by looking at me I've never had to worry about that <laughs> I've never had to worry about where my next meal was coming from and most of the time even in this even in this country uh, we've not had droughts and things to last so long that I mean it's like, what I'm trying to say is if you work you could eat I mean it's pretty well been that way through all of our lives so we wouldn't have knew what it would have been like to to have really been in need read Philippians 2 and 5 through 11 part of discussion here let's read it Philippians 2 and 5 through 11 says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ in Jesus in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to death even the death of the cross wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name and that the, and at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father Paul opens this passage about Christ with an admonition that we should have the same attitude that Jesus had how can you make that happen in everyday life How can you make that happen in everyday life? Well, if, if, if we're going to let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ, he came as a servant. 
he came as a servant he didn't even he didn't even judge a lot of people that were in sin he would just tell them go and sin no more at that time now he's coming back as judge he's going to serve as as our judge but at this time and folks while we're under the dispensation of grace we need to have that same like mind as of Christ to to leading others to him and knowing we can't physically extend grace to them but we can lead them to where they can get it but we can lead them to where they can get grace we should have this same attitude that Jesus had and we can make it happen in everyday life angelic announcement let's read verses 8 through 14 says and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field watching keeping watch over their flock by night and lo the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid and the angel said unto them fear not for behold I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord and this shall be a sign unto you you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward, toward men. Now when the angels announced Jesus' birth, they didn't go to the temple to find the religious leaders of that time, nor to the palace to tell the king. Instead, they went to a group of ordinary shepherds showing the inclusiveness of God's plan. This good news was for all, for everyone. It was for everyone. As a matter of fact, verse 10 says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. To all people. While the birth of Jesus was humble in its circumstances, it was not completely without fanfare. The birth announcement was made in such a way that it pointed again to Jesus coming to be the Savior of the world. Bordered by hills, Bethlehem was a good place to raise sheep, often to be offered as sacrifices. These sheep that were raised. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's another reason because a little bit later in the, in the lesson we're going to talk about Mary and Joseph going to make the sacrifice that they were supposed to. And we know that by them offering turtle doves or young pigeons instead of a lamb it lets you know that they were not rich they were not very rich in this world's goods because the people that were able were required to bring a lamb a spotless lamb and the ones that were not able could bring either the two turtle doves or pigeon young pigeons but this there's another thing this in verse 12 I want to go back here and read verse 12 again because it talks about it says and this shall be a sign unto you you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Wonder what that sign is. I mean, these angels are talking to shepherds. They're talking to a bunch of shepherds. You know, and I, I honestly don't know for sure, but I actually read a, uh, because I don't understand a lot of the culture for that time in that area of Bethlehem in the time at the birth of Christ but one of the things that I read about it said that at that time it was common for these shepherds to know that they were going to have to have that sacrifice they had to give God their first fruits or whatever and they could only give him the spotless lambs if there was anything at all wrong with them they couldn't offer them as a sacrifice and what they would do is they did it while these lambs were young real small so what they would do a lot of times to protect that spotless lamb to make sure that it did not get blemished in any way they would take that lamb when it was born and put it in that manger so possibly this could be what it's talking about here it says and this shall be a sign unto you 
you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger and when they walked in there and they saw that baby laying in that manger they knew that this was the sacrifice that this was the sacrifice that God had promised it's fitting perhaps it says that the, the first announcement of the Savior's birth was made to a group of shepherds while watching over their flocks at night to protect them from thieves and to attack and attack by wild animals an angel of the Lord came to these shepherds though they may have been largely unnoticed by the world God invited them to visit his son in the light of the glory of the Lord these poor shepherds were terrified the angel then spoke a word of peace spoke a word of peace as a matter of fact it's in verse 14 that it's talking about here it says glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill to men now it's very commonly known that Rome who were in control of Israel at this time and Bethlehem and all of these this nation that we're talking about here Rome and being in control of it were a conquering people they fought many many wars uh, you didn't control most of the known world at that time without being a very very strong military force but during this time that Jesus ministry has taken place from his birth and until his death this 33 years was they can look back in history and I have read this before they can look back in history and it was a relatively very peaceful time in Roman history during that 33 years maybe coincidence I think not I think Christ was here and that's why peace for the most part even in that Roman Empire ruled during that time and folks I'm gonna I tell you another thing that I believe we're not going to have peace until he returns the Roman Empire had relative peace during the 33 years that he was here on this earth and we're not going to have peace again until he returns but the shepherds were not in fear because this message was was one of good news for all people the angel spoke of Bethlehem the city of David where the Messiah had just been born he would save the people from their sins and the shepherds would find the baby lying in a manger or a feeding trough wrapped in strips of cloth this was a, a lowly birth for the highly exalted Son of God when the message had been given to the shepherds a large number of angels appeared praising God who is glorious above all things through his son God offers peace to all people and you know all these numbers of angels appeared also around about in the hills and praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and peace on earth and you get to thinking about it those angels are sinless beings they come into contact with God the ones that are not there was a group of them that followed Satan when he was cast out of, of, of heaven and the word says that a third of them his tail you know how the prophecy reads and took a third of them with him but these angels that come to announce the birth of Christ were sinless created beings messengers on God that does God's bidding that come into contact with him in heaven so you know that they're sinless if they can come into contact with him and it says that they glorified and praised God and they didn't need a savior and they don't need a savior how much more as we that need a savior should be glorifying him and praising him this morning than the, even these angels the peace the angel spoke of extends to us today we must first see the need to carry this message to individuals in our communities for there can be no peace in society without the peace in each person family and neighborhood it starts with prayer for this is a divine work and extends to people one-on-one -on -one. maybe we all find our place in extending God's peace through our hearts and our hands folks that's just the way that it takes place uh, the peace that these angels spoke of you know 
We need to carry this message to individuals in our communities. Why? Because I'm going to tell you something. Communities are changed one person at a time. You don't take, there's just no way that we can change our community or our nation without one by one changing the people that make up that community or that nation. And our responsibility is to teach our children and our grandchildren the truth. And to remember and to know that old truth that says what one generation tolerates, the next will embrace. We have so many young people today that would live a life that is so sinful and not even think that they're doing anything wrong because they just weren't taught. They weren't taught God's Word. They were not taught morals based upon the Holy Scripture as we were. And they think everything's fine. They think that they're, you know, and you can ask them if they're going to heaven. They'll say, well, I think I'm a good person. I think I'll go. About anybody you ask, they think they're a good person. And a lot of people are depending on, upon that to make it to heaven. And they're not going to be able to because there's no way in and of themselves that they can be good enough to make it. We're all going to go through the same door. And the thing about it is we've done a pretty good job of teaching about that door. What does Christ say? I'm the way, the truth, the light. He's also, the Word of God says, though, that there is a narrow way that leads to that straight gate. The, the Word of the God says, He says, narrow is the way, and straight is the gate that leads to salvation. We have did a pretty good job of teaching who that door is, and it's Christ. But it also says that there is a narrow way that leads to that straight gate. And it also says that there's a broad road that most people are on, and it don't go to that gate. It goes to a different one. And that's why it's so important that we teach our children these truths, that we teach them to know the difference. And also, you know, and I'm not preaching any kind of a, or teaching any kind of a doctrine that says you have to become good before you're saved. No, no, no. Because anybody, the vilest of sinner can be saved. And then it's when they realize and know that they have to find that old path. They have to find that straight path and walk in it. Because if they're walking any other direction, they're not headed the right way. But when we don't teach these things, then society as a whole, the only way that you change your nation is you teach your kids and your grandkids right from wrong and you take the time and go ahead and if they're living a certain way and they're practicing certain things that are stated in God's word to be an abomination, go ahead and tell them it's wrong. I'm sorry. If their name's John and they want to be Sue, they need to be taught that it's not right. That it's an abomination in the sight of God because this teaching is not there is the reason a lot of these young people are going that way and don't think that they're doing anything wrong to them it's just a fad and they get more attention and since they get more attention they keep going in a little further and a little further that's why it's so important that we do teach them All of these things is how we change our nation and how we change our communities. Good news embraced. Let's read verses 15 through 20. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem. And see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying 
and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. The shepherds didn't question the announcement by the angels. They simply hurried to Bethlehem to give praise to the, to the newborn Messiah. Praise for the work of God is always an appropriate response. The angelic proclamation inspired action, which was the response of faith. After the angels had left, the shepherds decided that they would go to Bethlehem to see this newborn baby. They were not going in order to prove that this were true or not, but to give praise for what had been told them. After a hurried search, they found Mary and Joseph with the baby lying in a manger. Their faith led them to find the promised Messiah. I'm, I'm, I promise you, had you saw an angel proclaiming his birth and saw countless numbers of angels rode up praising him and praising God, you wouldn't be going to find out if it was true. You've already seen something that's hard to believe right then. You wouldn't be going to see or not, whether or not it was the truth. You'd be going to praise Him, just like these shepherds were. When God speaks to us through His Word, we should also be inspired to act. Faith should produce a change on how we go about our lives. When their time with the baby was done, the shepherds once more expressed a simple faith that pleases God. They reported the good news to others about Jesus. The, wor the words of God's grace from the lowliest of men amazed those that they approached. They didn't just rejoice in the moment only to keep quiet about it afterward. They went out and told others who were in turn astonished by their message. Mary chose to keep these things to herself for a time, treasuring her memories of these events in her heart. She pondered them often. Also, the shepherds returned to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for what they had experienced. Their response of praise to God lifts our hearts yet today, for we know that God's grace extends to people at every level and status of life. Just like this song that we're going to be singing this morning, Go Tell It on the Mountain. This is God's will that we go and tell not that we just accept this gift and just kind of keep it to ourselves, but that we go and that we tell others. That was his last orders that he left before he ascended back up into glory, was that we go and that we tell others. He left us a commission, and it's called the Great Commission, that we would reach others. Even today, we can respond to God's grace, choosing to lift our voices to him in praise, through the day and to recognize his mercies in each day's events and we can also tell others about the Savior who came to bring peace and God's favor to all people what kind of thoughts and emotions might the shepherds have experienced that night what thoughts and emotions do you experience when God has done something amazing in your life I'll tell you when I'm thinking about what kind of thoughts and emotions that those shepherds might have experienced that night. You know, in this day and time, we'd have to be, we'd probably be thinking, well, is this some kind of trick? <laughs> you know, we got so much technology nowadays that so many things can be done. Uh, you know, that would, that would probably be our first thought. Is this a trick? Is somebody uh, trying to deceive us? But you know, these, these shepherds for sure had not. They had, they had never seen anything like it as far as uh, something playing out right in front of their very eyes without it being real. And they, they knew where to give the credit right off the bat. We might be thinking, you know, is this a trick? Is somebody projecting this up here that we can see some way or another, you know, by some technology? And we might be prone to be a little more suspicious of it but when when those people saw something like that I mean they they had no doubt that they knew it was God because it was the angels of God and it was uh, I'm you know the the Word of God says that the enemy can manifest itself as an angel of light so they had to know a measure of the word and know enough of those prophecies to believe and know that it was God and that's what we have to do also. Uh, 
the word of God says try, try the spirits to see whether or not that they are of God and the only way that we have at our disposal to do that is how much of the word we've studied and hid in our hearts and know that whatever those prophecies come to pass if, if they are scriptural then they're true if they line up with the word of God if they don't line up with the word of God don't ever let somebody try to tell you that God give them a new word if it doesn't line up with the word of God they got a word somewhere but it wasn't from God I promise you you know you have, I hear of people I actually hear of people saying now you know well God's doing a new thing and they're going to prophesy things to take place that doesn't line up with the word of God they may be getting a word from somebody but it's not God because any prophecy that does not line up with this word of God you can instantly know is not true how can you express your worship to God for sending his son to be the savior of the world I promise you it would be hard to express it is hard to express it's hard to find the words that's why a lot of times we just worship him in spirit the spirit takes over we worship God for what he's done for us because when we really realize the depth of what he has done for us and we really realize the shape that we're in without him it inspires worship it inspires worship seeing God's salvation let's read verses 21 through 35 and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child his name was called Jesus which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb and when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the man, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said Lord now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word for mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him and Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his Mother, behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now when Mary and Joseph took Jesus to be presented at the temple, they encountered Simeon, who was directed by the Holy Spirit, confirmed that the baby they were holding is truly the Christ he also gave them a glimpse of the future for this child Mary and Joseph had the baby Jesus circumcised on the eighth day in accordance with the law of Moses he was given the name Jesus the name the angel told Joseph to give him to give him Matt says see Matthew 1 and 21 Matthew 1 and 21 says and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins Jesus being of course the Greek form of the word Joshua the name Jesus means the Lord saves and reflects the mission of the Messiah Jewish mothers went through a time of ritual purification after giving birth which was 40 days for the birth of a son 
Following this time of purification, Mary and Joseph took Jesus to present him to the Lord at the temple in, Le in Leviticus 12. As a matter of fact, the first five verses talk about this time of purification. It says in the, then reading out of Leviticus 12, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed, and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days according to the days of the separation. For her infirmity shall she be unclean. And the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days, and she shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. But if she bear a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks as in her separation, and if she shall continue in the blood of her purifying three score and six days. So Jewish mothers went through this time of a ritual purification, and after giving birth, which was 40 days for, the, for a son, or following this time of purification, Mary and Joseph took Jesus to present him to the Lord at the temple. This ritual would involve the sacrifice of a pair of doves or pigeons for the poor or a lamb for the wealthy. Leviticus 12 and 8 because Leviticus 12 and 8 says and if she be not able to bring a lamb in other words if a person is not able and can't afford a lamb then she shall bring two turtle doves two turtles or two young pigeons the one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering and the priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be shall be clean at that time so in Jerusalem at that time was a man named Simeon a devout follower of God when Joseph and Mary came to the temple to make these sacrifices and they were following the law of God is what they were doing but in, in Jerusalem at this time this man named Simeon a devout follower of God who was longing for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel the Holy Spirit was with him and it revealed to him that he would not die until he saw Christ the anointed one Divinely directed, he went to Mary and Joseph in the temple and took the baby in his arms, offering praise to God for the fulfillment of his promise to Israel to provide salvation. Simeon could die in peace for the Messiah had come, the one who would be a light to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel's people. Mary and Joseph were amazed at what was said. It was not that they were aware of who Jesus was and is not and is but the scope of what he was to accomplish was being made clear to them he could not only he could be not only the glory of the people of Israel but he would also be the light to the Gentiles thank God the blessing of Simeon may well have surprised these parents even more the child would cause those who believe to be raised up and those who deny him to fall that's why it says that some would be raised up and some would fall those who chose him would be raised up and those who denied him would fall Simeon also said that a sword would pierce Mary's heart referring to Jesus suffering as she would one day observe I mean we don't have to think long to realize and know what that sword was that pierced Mary's heart to have to, have to watch her own child that she had loved and nurtured and raised be sacrificed questions in what ways can a Christian today reawaken the sense of wonder and amazement that was experienced that first Christmas in what ways can we do that by studying his word and by realizing what he's done for us and think on those things don't just read over it and that's it you know just like it's a fact that took place we can meditate on those good things of God and when we keep our mind and we think on these things we think on these things it builds that realization of what he's done and we become thankful and we can offer praise and we can offer worship and I'm talking about heartfelt praise and heartfelt worship not just singing some song by rote that we've memorized but by realizing and keeping being ever mindful of what he's done for us if we forget about it, if we don't ever think about it, we'll forget about it. If we don't ever think about what God's done for us, how are we going to give Him the praise and give Him the glory and give Him the honor that's due His name? 
How would you answer someone who asked what Christmas means to you? How would you answer someone? Sure. What does Christmas mean to you? Are you going to get to open a present? Uh, there you go. We've kind of made it that way where a lot of people, that, and a lot of especially younger people would think, but there's a lot of older people also. All they think about is that Christmas bonus <laughs> that they're going to get. They're, they're, that's really thrilling them more than what God did for them is that Christmas bonus that they're going to get along about that time. And yet we don't realize that we've received a gift that money can't buy, that all the money in the world could never buy. That's why it does us good to think on these things and to realize, yes, it's nice to get that Christmas bonus. It's nice to get those Christmas gifts. And the thing about it is we do it in the joy of that season. And we don't ever want to forget the reason, the true reason for the season. That's why I'm sorry. I don't like it. I hear somebody say, Happy Holidays. Didn't do it for me. <laughs> I'd rather hear that Merry Christmas. Jesus proclaimed as the Savior. Let's read verses 36 through 38. It says, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. So her, her husband died after they'd only been married then seven years. And she was a widow of about four score and four years. We know how many uh, four score is, don't we? 20, 40, 60, 80. That's 84 years. So she had lived as a widow for 84 years. She'd been married for seven. She was probably at least, wouldn't you say, 15 or 16 when she got married at least. So this woman was probably well over 100 years old. It says, As she was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. I was supposed to read 38. I done forgot. Night and day, she stayed in that temple. She didn't come out. Verse 38. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. The message of Jesus was beginning to spread even when he was a baby. Not only did the shepherds tell others about him, but later in Luke, we see that Anna, an elderly widow, eagerly talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. While Joseph and Mary were at the temple in Jerusalem to present Jesus, a prophetess, Anna, approached them. Her husband had died just after seven years of marriage and now she stayed at the temple praying and fasting continually moved by the spirit Anna gave thanks to God speaking to those around her who longed for the redemption of Jerusalem people around us are looking for something meaningful to fill their lives at Christmas this search is heightened as people look to recapture some sense of the peace or joy that the birth of Jesus promises this desire can be met as Christians proclaim Jesus as the Savior of the world. The Christmas season provides many opportunities to share with the lost good tidings of great joy. One way to do this is to take part in giving to those in need. Perhaps through the church or a local need-based agency, work together with your family and friends to relieve some of the stress that single parents or those living alone might be feeling at this time of the year. Folks, this is what we're talking about here is, and it gives you a very good excuse to share the gospel with people during this time. During this time of year, there are many ways that we can help others and come to see the truth that Jesus is the Savior of the world. In a world that is in darkness, this message of light and hope is vital. Let us seek the Spirit to guide us to co-workers, neighbors, or others who may be longing for some sign of hope and peace in a holiday that has become mostly materialistic.
And folks, unfortunately, it has become mostly materialistic. When you see it advertised in the things on television, they're, they're saying happy holidays rather than Merry Christmas. And they're doing it for a reason because they still want to sell to those people that they think that might offend. So happy holidays is a lot more generic. That way, you know, nobody's going to get offended. But folks, that's one thing we need to put away this morning as we come before him this morning and we praise and worship him for what he's done and he sent a savior and folks what we are commemorating this morning and what we're praising him for is the birth of that savior